Hello, and welcome to Monumental, where we sit down with entrepreneurs, leaders, visionaries, and big thinkers making monumental change. Here's your host, Evan Holliday. Welcome back to Monumental. I'm your host, Evan Holliday, and today on the show, we have Chris Benson. Chris, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, Evan. How are you today? Great, great. Glad to have you on the show today. Glad we got connected. Uh, so a little bit about Chris before we get started. Chris is the Chief Investment Offer Officer for Reliant Investments and is one of, they are one of the top commercial self-storage operators in the U.S. in 2018. And he's part of the Investment Committee and develops institutional quality self-storage investment opportunities for accredited investors. So I'm really excited to, for me to even learn about self-storage and the opportunities and, and really let's just get started and jump right into to how you got into real estate and, and your beginning of your journey, Chris. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, well, Evan, so my journey, um, like many people, I got out of college and got a corporate job. Uh, mine happens to be in sales. So I was in all different types of sales uh, throughout my career. Most recently, my last corporate job was with a company called Intuitive Surgical. Um, they manufacture the Da Vinci robot. For some of your listeners, you guys may know who that is. Um, the technology is incredible, uh, and as is the company. They, they were unbelievable. Um, but what happened for me, Evan, probably not too dissimilar uh, than you, was when I turned about 28, uh, 29, I distinctly remember waking up and thinking, I don't think I can do this another 30 years. Um, <laughs> I was making great money, uh, that, that wasn't the issue, but uh, certainly that my work-life balance was way out of whack. Uh, not that it's much better now, I still seem to work quite a bit, uh, but there was a, a moment where I realized if I, I had to stop trading time for money and instead create an opportunity where my money can make me money. And I think with the goal of freedom, like many of us have, right? And you know, I think that's, everybody has a different why as to they, why they get into real estate. But for me, that was it. I, I could see what I wanted and it wasn't to make lots of money, although that's nice. For me, it was how do I do this and, you know, ski every day or go yeah. to the lake and, or do whatever it is that I want to do um, and not be beholden to it. So for me, that, that was sort of my catalyst moment that, that got me into real estate. So you said around 28, 29, what, was there somebody else that was doing real estate that you were learning from or what was, what was the catalyst exactly? I'm going to give you the, the, the worst answer you probably could ask for. It was rich dad, poor dad. <laughs> I love it. I love so, it. So I know that's an answer that, that uh, certainly checks a box of almost everybody, but I read it when I was like 25 and that was the first time I had been exposed to it. And then read it again as I got older and it just made sense. And for me, Evan, when, you know, Kiyosaki talks about creating passive income streams, uh, real estate seemed like one that I could get my arms around. You know, I, I have certain skill sets. Um, creativity really isn't mine. So thinking about creating a business that was going to do it didn't seem to make sense, but real estate's numbers, uh, you know, it's, it's a fairly straightforward process that just at its, at its core, I could get my arms around and, uh, and make it work. I love it. So, um, so what, what was the next step after you read the book? Did you immediately quit your job or what was the, what was the transition like? Well, so I think like everybody, um, you know, you start with an education piece and just trying to understand more about it. Um, and so I did that for, uh, a while. I'm trying to think of the exact date, at, at least multiple months. And uh, so how we got started was a duplex. My brother actually needed a place to live. And so we bought a, a duplex in the town that I lived in and actually still own it. Um, but we bought a duplex in the town that I live in. And um, that duplex uh, was the start of our real estate journey. And so when I started, Evan, the plan was if I could net $200 a door, uh, net, net. So if I bought a duplex, I got to make 400 bucks a door. I could essentially get to a place where if I had 50 units, right, that's 10 grand a month, you know, assuming depreciation shields most of that, that's a pretty good living. It didn't replace my income, but it got me to a position where I said, okay, like I could make that work if I had it, had to and didn't want to work anymore. 
So that was the original plan. Uh, we did it for a while, and then I realized I hated <laughs> uh, small multifamily. Um, and, and it just wasn't scalable, right? I, what I didn't like about it was the people part of it. I could outsource the management aspect, mowing lawns, fixing toilets. Um, but ultimately, I still, you know, we were renting B, B minus type properties. And, and it was the people part that I really struggled with. Um, and I also heard a podcast or I read it. I don't really know where I have it, but I've stolen this for my own. Um, and the quote was, big deals and small deals are the same amount of work. You just make less money on small deals. And that was sort of a, an aha moment for me where I said, oh, I just need to go bigger. Um, and what happened was we ended up selling that, that, port, that uh, those properties. So I had a little bit of equity. And, and again, I made good money in my day job. And I called a family that I had grown up with um, that ran a construction company and said, hey, I want to build a commercial multifamily property. Uh, what do you got? And literally, I mean, you know, call it um, good fortune, luck, whatever. He said, Chris, funny you called. Now, I hadn't talked to this guy in 15 years. He said, funny you called. Uh, I just had a meeting with this city not too far from where I grew up. They're looking to develop this piece of land. They'll give us a great deal on um, the permitting process. I can get the land for dirt cheap. Let's go have a conversation. And that was the beginning of it. And uh, long, long story short, we ended up building a 64 unit apartment complex in phases. Um, class A in that town, you could call it a luxury, uh, luxury apartment. And um, that was sort of the, oh, this is how big boy real estate works. And it, it was an incredible learning experience, Evan. Um, <laughs> fortunately, I had a fantastic partner who, um, and I'll give him a little plug, his name's Steve Buck. He runs a company, uh, and his son, Chris Buck, and he runs a company out of uh, Whitesboro, New York called Buck Construction. And um, literally, I was on his coattails, right? I mean, he understood how to develop stuff. I didn't, and I just kind of was along for the ride. And, and my role in the partnership really was the equity play. And so with that, I had an incredible opportunity to learn from him how commercial real estate works. That's great. I, I love that you went from, you know, doing a duplex and it sounds like kind of house hacking with your brother um, to, to graduating to, what'd you say, 64 units? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the first one. That's, that's impressive. So, and not only 64 units, but developing 64 units. Most people don't graduate that quickly to, to actually doing construction. So Evan, fortunately I had a wife or I have a wife uh, who is just as risk tolerant as I am and was willing to basically bet our life savings on the idea that this was going to turn out okay. Um, <laughs> and I think that that was, look, if I could give anybody some advice, you know, as to what you're trying to describe in this monumental podcast is if I knew what I knew now, I probably wouldn't have done it then, but I was naive and um, there, there comes a point where you just have to jump, you know, you have to be willing to make the change. And, and I know you've done it personally, um, to make that change and, and have that growth. And for me, that was the big one. I, I was still working a job at that point. Um, but once I understood how that world worked, that was the, oh, that's how I make this thing scalable. Yeah. So what, what, made you confident enough to go after that 64 unit deal? Naivety. <laughs> That's the answer. I mean, it, it, so look, I understood it was an incredible opportunity to learn from somebody who had significant experience in the space. Um, and so for me, it was like you said, hey, I can skip a whole bunch of steps, right? Everybody kind of follows this path of, you know, I invest in residential real estate, I get enough capital to go into bigger commercial multifamily. And then eventually you sell that out and hopefully become the bank, right? And that's when your money really is work is making your money and you're not doing anything. Um, and I had the opportunity to basically in my mind, skip a step and say, okay, I don't need to scale this to where I thought I did. Um, fortunately I, I had some equity saved from just my day job and, you know, selling the properties that we had uh, acquired. So it was honestly just that thought process. I didn't know enough about underwriting to underwrite the deal. It was a purely trust play with my partner and, and it's been fantastic. That's great. I think there's a lot of lessons for our monumental listeners. I think first off is, you know, you, you 
this sounds very basic, but it's, it's like saving from your W2 job so that you can have a little bit more leverage and, and ability to go after some bigger deals. Um, that's a huge one that, that people sometimes overlook is, is saving and being able to put aside uh, money for investment is a huge first step toward actually going after deals um, and, and being able to take that monumental leap, like you said, and, and go full on into real estate. Um, so I think that's one thing. And then the other thing is you partnered with somebody who sounded like was a great partner that had experience in construction that was able to, you were able to learn from along the journey. So you didn't just jump into this by yourself. You, you know, you were able to partner with somebody that was maybe a few steps ahead of you. Yeah. I think there's a third thing there too, that I would give you. And at least in my experience, it's been critical is, um, some of the best opportunities I've been a part of have been because of a cold call. I, literally, I hadn't talked to Steve Buck since I was 15 years old. And, and I think the ability to call someone and say, hey, here's what I'm trying to do. You never know where that leads. Yeah. And I can tell you, and as you hear my story, it's going to happen again of how I got to self-storage. It was literally the same thing. Um, there's, a, there's a guy, T. Boone Pickens. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's a oh, natural yeah. gas yeah, billionaire. And he's in his, I think he's in his late 80s at this point. But he says a thing that I really love, and it's deals create deals. And, and what he's referencing is he gets involved with one thing and other opportunities present themselves as he's gotten involved in that thing. And so many opportunities presented it to him just because he was involved in something else. And I think for, for all of us, that's a critical part is n not being like closed minded to say, hey, I don't know enough you get into something and you never know what the next thing that's going to present itself in front of you is going to be. I'll yeah. give you one more analogy just cause it's really good. I stole yeah. it from Brandon and bigger pockets. He told me at once and it's a great one. He, he used to live for many of your listeners who know what bigger pockets is. He's, I think, I don't know if he was a co-founder, but certainly one of the, the major contributors yeah, yeah. to the bigger pockets world. And so he lived in the Pacific Northwest. Now he lives in Hawaii, but um, he talks about driving in the fog of the Pacific Northwest. And he's like, look, what I try to tell people is your journey is like driving in the fog up here. I can only see eight feet in front of me. I don't know what's a half mile down the road. The road could be out and I could drive off a cliff. But every time I go another eight feet, another eight feet opens up in front of you. And for me, that was just a great analogy to be like, look, I don't know what the end point is, right? At the end of the road, I don't know what's there. But what I do know is I'm going to get another eight feet and then another eight feet in front of me clears up and then we can make a decision on which way to go. And I think it's a good thing no matter where you are in your career. You know, I would say as a professional real estate person now, it still applies because I don't know what my end game is yet. For someone who's just getting started, it's the same thing. The key in all of these things is if you don't drive at all, if you just stop, you never see the next eight feet. Yeah. So I, I, I wish I could say I made that up, but it's Brandon's and it's a good one. I love it. I love both of those. Chris is dropping bombs over here. This is awesome, man. <laughs> So um, real quick, I'm just curious. So does, does T. Boone Pickens, does he have any books? Is that where you read that or? Yeah, he, he did an autobiography and it's, it's older. I want to say like late 2000s. Uh, he has an autobiography and I don't remember exactly what it is. I'd look on the bookshelf that's behind me here, but I don't <laughs> think I have it. I give a lot of my books away after I read them. I like it. That's a good practice. How, how long have you been doing that? Uh when it, I think it's relevant, you know, I guess, yeah. I guess for a while I, I like to read. And, um, and so when I think it's relevant to the person I'm talking to, usually they just kind of do what these are, right. They, they just sit on the shelf and keep there, yeah. them back up, but I'd, I'd rather give them to somebody else who finds value in them. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I've ended up buying multiple copies of books that I really enjoy just cause I'm like, I, I want people to experience these too. And I, and I want us to have good conversations about these books that they haven't already read them. Yep. 100% with you. So going back to that 64 unit deal. So after you, at what point did you, did you decide to go full on real estate and quit your job? Well, so what happened was sort of, as I said, we did it in 16 unit phases to kind of prove out our, our investment hypothesis. So while that was going on, um, one of my good friends that I grew up with from home um, started developing in South Boston. And he syndicated his first deal, which I didn't even know existed. I didn't understand that syndication was a thing. And he called me one day and said, Hey, I'm raising $900,000 for this, you know, nine unit condo. Can you help? And I said, 
how are you raising that money? And when he explained syndication, I was like, oh, that makes sense. Um, and so for me, what happened was a lot of my peer network in the job that I had and friends and family knew what I was doing and said, hey, next deal, let me know. I want to get exposed to, to real estate. So my original plan was to syndicate my own multifamily projects. Um, and what I realized really quickly as we got the 64 units up and going is I didn't like operations. It's just not my skill set, right? I, I, I don't like the detail piece. I like chasing the deal and I like the money part, um, but I don't necessarily like the minutia of managing a PL. and l yeah. So for me, what I said was, well, I'm going to make mistakes. You know, I'm, I'm one project deep. If I'm going to bring investors into this, can I go partner with professional operators who do this as a business and who actually need access to equity? And when I had that thought process, then I just called a bunch of multifamily operators um, who you can find online and said, hey, I got some equity. I like the types of projects you're working on. Can I bring equity to the deal and earn ownership in the back end? And so at that point, I had done enough homework and understood real estate well enough where I could do due diligence on these properties. And so for our investors, make a decision of, hey, is this a property I want to invest in personally and bring an investor group in? And so that's what we did. Um, we invest in some multifamily properties across the U.S. as passive or as a syndicator, mm -hmm. um, and earning ownership in the back end of those properties. Um, and that worked really well. Uh, and then about three years ago, and, and this is the shift of how I got to Reliant um, and self-storage, about three years ago, one of those operators came to me and said, hey, multifamily is too hot. Cap rates have compressed too much. We're done. I was like, what do you mean you're done? And they said, we're going to wait. We're going to wait for the next correction and um, we'll clean up the blood in the streets when that happens. And so they, you know, they have a billion dollars under management. They can afford to wait. Um, but it was a wake up call for me to say, hey, maybe I should look at some other asset classes. Um, and so I did some homework and I fell in love with some of the metrics and I'd be happy to share why. But there were basically three pillars of why I love self-storage. Um, and that brought me to the self storage arena. And when I saw those pillars, then I said, okay, well, I just got to go find the operators who need access to equity. And I basically did the same thing. There's a, a top 100 list that comes out every year from it's called mini co storage. It's like an industry newsletter and you can see who the top hundred investors or the top hundred self storage operators are, um, you know, by, uh, by square footage. And so I just started calling them and said, Hey, I have some equity. I, I want to invest in the asset class. Will you, will you give me some back end ownership? And long, long story short, I started as an investor in Reliant and that's what brought me to storage. Huh. So you mentioned earlier, cold calling got you into partnering with Reliant. How did, how did that come about? Um, so there are six publicly traded companies in self storage. There's five REITs and then U-Haul, right? Everybody knows who U-Haul is. They're not a REIT, but they're obviously publicly traded. And then basically I just started going down the list after that and calling people who would take my call saying, Hey, I'm looking for, or I have some equity. I'm interested in the asset class. Will you have a meeting with me and discuss how we may be able to work together? And so, um, we met with a number of self storage operators. Reliant was one of them. And, um, Evan, in my experience investing passively, um, I invest in the people part first. Yeah. Right. Where the, the properties are certainly important, but you know, as a, as a partner, you're really giving up most of your control to the general partner or the operator. And so to me, the critical component of this is the people who are running it. Everybody's friendly when, you know, things are going well or when they're pitching you on why you should be yeah. part of the deal. Um, but what I want is the good human part first. Um, the deals usually take care of themselves and, and that's worked pretty well. And, and look in this business, no one bats a thousand and you will, uh, if you're in it long enough, lose money. Like it's just a function of the business. Yeah. But what I want is when I'm all done, I want to have partnered with people that it was fun to build a relationship with. And so with Reliant, there were two founders, Todd Allen and Lou Pollock. Um, Lou's somewhat retired from the business. He's in his seventies and Todd, um, who's a little older than me, um, and is basically managing the day to day operations was that guy that's who I fell in love with is as a human being, he's fantastic. He's also a good real estate operator. Um, and so what happened was I was an investor first. 
um, and we invested in a couple of projects with Reliant. And then uh, about a year and a half ago, um, Todd and I were looking at a property in Atlanta and having dinner and, and he mentioned that he was having trouble raising equity, which um, with Reliance track record as a salesperson, uh, it's, that is a silly con, it didn't make any sense to me. And so um, I had quit my job at this point. Um, so I was raising equity full time, like that was my role. And so long, long story short, we struck up a partnership that that brought us to me as the chief investment officer, basically running the equity arm of the business at Reliant and then working with our acquisitions team on, um, you know, strategy around the properties that we're buying. And, you know, it's been, uh, it's been an exciting journey. That's awesome. So it, it goes back to what you said is like the cold calling is, is such a, is such a, an important habit um, to develop. It's just, making a call, reaching out to somebody, talking to somebody at some event, because you really never know. Like, I feel like people are like, oh, I'm going to a networking event. It's like, well, life is networking. Like mm. you're constantly networking with people and you never know what could happen. And, and it, you never know when you're going to hit it off with somebody and, and you're going to develop a great relationship. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just like with you and Reliant, it's like you made that call, you, you figured out, hey, we got something good going here. And and the rest is history. And now you're moving to Georgia. It's not history yet, but I hope so. <laughs> I hope five years from now, Evan, you know, when we we're talking, then we've, we've had a major liquidity event to a re and then it's history. Then yeah. Talking to you somewhere, uh, maybe still in Georgia. I don't know, but yeah, it's, you know, I think for, for your listeners and it, no matter what stage of the game you're at, you have to be willing, and, and this has been the other part of my journey that's been hugely helpful, and you hit it on already, is the partner piece. I have a specific skill set, right? I, I'm a salesperson, and I'm an executor. If you give me a task, I'm going to figure out how to go do it. Um, I'm not a minutiae operational person, and Todd, yep. it, that's his baby. He loves operations, right? And that's his background. So with the storage marriage, you know, but we're, we're a vertically integrated self-storage operator. So we're buying and running the properties we're buying. And Todd, the operations team rolls up to Todd. And, and I'm free to do what my skill set is, which is raise equity. You know, and, and I think that's a critical part to this is for people listening, find the people who complement your skill sets. You know, do what you do well and then go find other people that do what you don't want to do well. And, and look, there are some points like, you know, when we built the 64 unit, we managed it ourselves. Yeah. And that's how I realized I don't like this. Yeah, exactly. So it's not like you can't, you know, you, you may have to do it for a time, but when you realize you don't like it, you know, find somebody else who will do it with you. So that brings up a good point for our monumental listeners. Is that something that, um, you know, they should be doing constant introspection on themselves or, or just learning as they're going on what they do and don't like? How do you find out what you do and don't like and what you're good and bad at? <laughs> Well, I mean, how you do and don't like things that I literally, when you think to yourself, Ugh, I, I don't want to do this. Usually that's a pretty good indication that you don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, and for me, I've always been, um, I've always been a, if it's not the way I want it, I'm, I'm going to go change it. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I guess, um, somewhat confident and I can make it the way that I want it. And, and I think that's just me personality wise, right? Or, you know, I, I think that's a big piece from the entrepreneurial mindset to say, well, this doesn't work. Let's, let's go do something else, you know, and we'll find that to work. And um, you have to be willing to say it doesn't work and then do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that brings up a, another good point is like when you, when you don't feel comfortable, um, don't just you know, keep going with it, you know, figure out a way that you can be both happy and moving closer towards your goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's the, the hard part. And still for me to this day is like, what's the end point? You know, like, I think I know what it is. Um, but does that mean when I'm, when I get there, like I'm done or I, the answer is probably not. Um, you know, I think everybody finding that why that's the heart that is still to the day today for me, the, the hardest part is saying, this is why I'm doing this. You know, I mean, the money pieces, I've been fortunate to make some and that doesn't make anybody happy. 
you know? Uh, so it, you got to find a better reason than that. Yeah. So, so what is, what is your, why, what is your, what is your driving force? I knew I was going to set myself up for that question. <laughs> so, I mean, for me right now, it's freedom, right? It's, it's the ability to, um, it's the ability to be in a position to do whatever I want, whenever I want to. Um, and certainly money's not everything, but it helps, right? I mean, there are, you know, I, I skied with a guy in Jackson Hole last year that lives in a hotel and cooks on a hot plate, but he skis every day of the year. Well, yeah. I don't quite want that part. I want, I'd like to ski maybe not every day, but when I want to and live in a pretty nice house when I go home. So yeah. I think there, there's definitely balance to that and everybody has a different comfort level. But for me, it's the freedom aspect. It's, it's the controlling my time as you get older and, and I'm 39, right? So um, you realize that that's the only irreplaceable commodity that we have is there is a time thing that you can't get back. You know, you can get money, you get toys, you can do that. The time and relationships part are the parts yeah. you can't, you can't fix. So, um, that, that's what I'm trying to control right now. Um, and, and with Reliant, you know, we have an incredible growth opportunity. And so my why right now is I want to help build the business so that when we're done, whenever that is, whether that's five years or 20 years, we look back and say, Hey, that was fun. Like, and it was fun doing it with a group of people that you enjoy working with. Yeah. That's my, that's my thing right now. It's the reason we're relocating is cause it's going to be a lot easier to help build that. I can raise money remotely. Um, but it's going to be a lot easier to build the business aspect if I'm there. Yeah. That's awesome, man. That's a, that's a huge step. And I think that's important too, to bring up is like having, having fun while you're doing it. I mean, it's, it's great to have a successful business, but if you're not having fun, you're not enjoying yourself, you're not surrounding yourself with great people. Um, I think that's one of the most important parts about a, creating a, a good business. Yeah, for sure. And, and look, I, I am not, uh, going to pretend and say every day is fun, right? As you're growing a business right. Uh, like right now, we're going through some things at Reliant that aren't fun, but are part of the growing pains of, of growing that. And so, you know, it's not like every day I wake up and I'm like, Oh my God, what an incredible <laughs> day to be alive. I don't want to set the wrong expectation, <laughs> but you know, I'm, I'm having more of those than the ones where you're just like, I can't believe this is what we're doing today. You know? Yeah. So, it's, it, there, there's definitely some pain along the way. And if, if you want, you know, exceptional growth, then those kind of things you have to be willing to sacrifice. Yep. hundred percent. I love that little, uh, I love that little, little voice we got from Chris right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. so, so you mentioned the three pillars of why you love self self storage. Let's, let's dive into that. Yeah, for sure. So, um, when I was doing my homework, um, the first thing that, I think all of us want to look at is returns, right? Like how is the asset class performed? Um, and, and Evan, I can send you uh, the data set that I used and still use. Uh, I really like it. It's free. All your listeners can get there. It's the national association of REITs. Um, and for those that don't know, REIT stands for real estate investment trust. Um, and they have 25 plus years of data that um, basically you can compare asset class by asset class of all the publicly traded REITs. So it's not a perfect comparator, but it's a good way to take apples to apples and say, okay, how did office do right. versus retail? Um, so uh, storage in the last 25 years did just under 17% a year, which wow. is incredible. Um, multifamily, which I had invested in and kind of everybody believes is the sexy asset class. Maybe it's maybe it's industrial now, but multifamily for a long time was the, the sexy asset class, um, had done just under 13%. So still really well, but storage it outperformed in the long term. So, um, and then to give you a baseline, the S&P 500 over that same time of period did just over 7%. So for those of you listeners who are still trying to understand why you invest in real estate, I, you know, I don't know how yeah. else to show it to you. Um, <laughs> Pretty cut and dry. Yeah. I mean, returns, tax benefits, it's, it's unfair. But that being said, um, the second part of it is you have great returns, but I'm a believer that the market is cyclical. So everything that has happened or that is happening has already happened before. It's just a matter of time. And so the next downturn, um, I wanted to see what happened in the last one. So in 2007, eight, nine storage lost less than 4% of the value. Um, comparatively to apartments was almost seven. Retail and office got crushed, double digits. And then S&P 500 was down 22 plus percent, something like that. Wow. 
So, you know, you have this upside and then you have this downside protection, which for me, that sounds like a great investment thesis on its, on its face. But the third pillar is really why I'm moving to Roswell. Um, so storage, uh, right now, there are six publicly traded companies, as I had mentioned, that own about 25% of the marketplace. The rest, the 70 plus percent, depending on what data set you look at, is owned by operators all over the board. So companies like us, you know, regional operators, we have 48 properties across seven states that we own and then we manage, you know, six or seven more. But there are still a ton of mom and pop operators. And, you know, Evan, I know your background is multifamily. In multifamily, it's really hard to find that now because so much institutional capital has come into the market and yeah. bought those up. It's hard to find those value add plays from a, you know, hey, my dad built this place 25 years ago and we right. just collecting cash flow. But in storage, there's still a lot of those opportunities. Hmm. So for me, um, that was the real catalyst for the asset class was the, the runway that exists in front of it. Yes, there's great returns. Um, yes, there's some downside protection, or at least there was in the last cycle. But more importantly, there's an opportunity for a roll-up strategy, you know, kind of like private equity does where, you know, they may go into an industry and I know a guy who bought uh, 200 plus Jiffy Lubes, right? And he rolled them all up, got all the efficiencies attached to them, marketing, you know, operations, et cetera, and then sold that whole package off to institutional uh, capital. And in, in my vision of storage, as institutional capital continues to seek yield, right? Multifamily is slowly dropping. That big, those big investments are happening in other asset classes. It's happening in storage. It's happening in industrial. It's happening in mobile home parks um, because the money is chasing the return. And there's so much capital right now and not enough deals. Mm -hmm. That's why the cap rates in multifamily has gotten pushed so low. In my opinion, artificially low because there's so much capital chasing. Um, so, you know, we hope to be in a position where as cap rates compress in storage, we're exiting properties and obviously growing value. So sorry, that was a long three pillar speech, but that that's really my, my, you know, thesis or hypothesis behind storage. That's great, man. I, you've, you've educated me in the process. I mean, um, a, a lot of that makes a lot of sense to me. I think there is um, a lot to be said for, like you said, how much money and capital and institutional capital is going into multifamily, um, and then of course all the other asset classes, and even even mobile home parks. There's lots of institutional capital starting to get into that as well. Um, yeah, but for sure. But it sounds like there's still opportunity to be had in self storage. Yeah, I, I you know I mean um, there there's our biggest risk in storage right now is right. I'm not the only person who saw that data. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. As to why storage is a good investment. So there's been a huge development cycle. Um, 2017, 2018, uh, the storage industry delivered the most new net rentable square footage in the history of the asset class. And 2019 is supposed to be pretty close to where 2018 was. We'll, we'll see as the year closes out. And then it's supposed to plateau. But now there's this huge glut of supply in the market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What will be interesting is to see you know, what happens. Up until this point, the demand has met it, right? And um, you know, we're not seeing properties get sent back to the bank yet, right? Because that's the indicator, right? Is once banks start taking properties back, then all those merchant builders who develop these deals, um, whether they're storage operators or not, you know, they're not hitting their, or their original metrics. So that part isn't happening, which means demand is filling it. Now, there are markets that are certainly oversupplied where rent growth is going the wrong way as they start to lease these properties up. Um, but what's interesting about storage, um, and not to get too much into the weeds, is it's a very micro market business. So all that really matters is the one, three, and five mile radius, maybe broader. But think of it this way, Evan, right? In multifamily, people will drive for location, school district, um, amenities. In storage, it's a garage, right? Yeah. So it may be an air conditioned garage, but you're not driving to get a garage. It's yeah. got to be convenient either to work or home. We're a yeah. business of convenience. And so even if a market is oversupplied, we can have these little pockets where there are still opportunities. You know, like maybe Atlanta is oversupplied, but that doesn't mean that in one of the suburbs of Atlanta in Roswell, 
that there isn't a pocket in that one, three, and five where you can find a hole. So it's really a sharpshooter's game at this point. So how, what kind of opportunities are you all looking for uh, in, in self-storage? So for us, um, Todd's background is everything. So he and his partner both have a deep understanding. Lou bought his first property and developed it in the early 80s. Um, so he was really one of the first. Um, and then Todd on the operational side has done everything. So we'll look at anything. We'll look at development ground up deals. We'll look at, you know, retrofits kind of dark box. You know, we take a Toys R Us and fill it full of storage units. Um, we'll do value add, which is our sweet spot right now, which is we're looking for essentially, you know, not too dissimilar than multifamily value add, right? We're, we're looking for B location or A location, B, B minus property, C property, and we're going to do some expansion um, to make it institutional class. So that's, that's really been our sweet spot in the last couple of years. Last year, we did 10 properties and eight of them were value add. Um, this year, you know, we're in the middle of raising a $50 million fund and of the $45 million under contract right now, property wise, uh, you know, uh, 10, uh, 11 out of the 12 are what I would consider value add. Now the value add is different. Not all of them are put a shovel in the ground and build an extra building. Um, but all of them have a component of that's how we're growing. The NOI is some sort of value add component. That's great. Um, so what, what do you think has been, what do you think has led to your success as far as capital raising for self storage? Uh, I, I would give, well, I'm a pretty good salesperson, right? I, you know, and that that's what my career was. Um, so I have a skill set that aligns me to that and understanding what people want. But but I'll give more credit to Todd and what they've built at Reliant is their track record's incredible, right? We we've sold 21 properties, and our average IRR on those properties, whatever metric you want to look at, our IRR is a 45. So oh, wow. it's like <laughs> selling ice. You know, like it it would be like selling ice cream you know, in death Valley, like, yeah, of course I want, I want to do that. Yeah. And so uh, our story is really strong. And, and right now, Evan, as you know, probably in your space, there are, there's a lot of capital, right? People are trying to diversify and create some sort of non-correlated investment plan that isn't tied to the stock market. So mm -hmm. if people think the market's hot, they want something that when it goes down, it may not be tied. The valuation may not drop with the market. So um, that's been a big part of it. And you know, I think um, I'm continuing to evolve on the, the capital raising side too. Um, the argument of big deals, small deals are the same amount of work. You just make less money is also true with investors. Um, so we have a really strong individual high net worth accredited network of individual people. Um, but we've really focused on um, some other avenues of investing. This week we met with Harvard and Yale's endowment. Evan, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you know how much money the top 20 universities in the United States manage in their endowments? I, I want to say it's probably in the hundreds of billions or trillions. $500 billion. Wow. At 20 universities. It's nuts. Wow. So uh, we, we had the opportunity this week to meet with number one and number two. So Harvard's got, I don't know, 38 billion, I think, and Yale's got 29. Um, and so it's an interesting discussion how they view their investment much differently than an individual investor. And so, you know, the reason I bring up, not that we're going to move away from individual investors, we're not, it's good business for us to be well diversified where our equity comes from, but, you know, look, if I spend two months with a Harvard or Yale, their yeah. minimum investment size is $100 million, right? With the goal to get it bigger than that because they have so much capital to deploy. And so yeah. you know, for me, and, and I'm still going through that evolution, just like we've talked about, like it's about thinking bigger. It's like, okay, you know, yes, we can build this, but what we really need is more so as long as we can continue to source properties that fit our underwriting standards, well, then we got to have equity to support it. So I think that's part of that constant growth of understanding, hey, just think bigger, like, you know, scale. Yeah, I love that. Well, um, I'd love to see how that turns out with Harvard and Yale and, and other endowments as, as you guys continue growing. 
Yeah, me too. I, I uh, <laughs> we'll see what happens. Eight yeah. feet at a time, right, Evan? Exactly. I just drop another eight feet. We'll see what the fog brings us. Exactly. Um, so what would be your one piece of advice for somebody that's hears this is like, all right, I want to get into self storage. You know, what are their next steps? Well, you're saying buy a self storage property. Yeah. Partner. <laughs> it's a really operationally intensive business, different, different than residential. So, uh, on the storage, you know, it depends what you're doing, right. In, in the scale at which you're going at it. But, um, you know, for specifically for storage, educate yourself, find people you can align with who have skill sets that may help, um, what you're trying to do. Um, on the storage side, there's a ton of resources out there. There's something called the, the annual self storage almanac, which is a great industry resource to look and see what's happening nationally with the, the asset class. Um, you know, that's a great place to start. There's a ton of industry, um, uh, associations you can get involved with as well, just to learn more about what's happening in storage right now. Um, but the other, you know, the, the advice I would give people is, and this isn't just for storage, but anybody on the real estate path is look, you got to educate, um, to a point and then you got to jump. Yep. If you wait to know everything, you'll never do anything. Like it's just where I've learned the most good and bad is when I'm in it, right? Like yeah. you got to be in it to understand what's happening so that the next one can be better. And that's the piece that I think for me and my journey has been the most impactful is um, I'm risk tolerant enough where I'm like, okay, what's the worst that can happen? You know, I, I can always go back and get a job, you know, and yeah. that's, I'm not telling you like I'm this super brave guy that I never have sleepless nights. That isn't true at all. <laughs> but um, you know, and my wife, I, I give her a lot of credit supporting me to do that and just pushing to be like, look, what's the worst that can happen? Like, you're not going to die. Yeah. You know, my wife always asked the question like, well, are you alive? Yes. Well, then it's not that bad. Exactly. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great mindset to have. And in any sort of growth in your life is like, just look at it as a positive situation and, and look at it as, hey, you know, this could be a lot worse. And this is actually a great situation wherever I'm at. Yeah, it's easy to say right now, Evan, until those things are punching you in the face and you're like, oh my gosh, what are we doing? <laughs> One, eight, or you said eight feet at a time. Eight feet at a time. You got it. Yep. All right. Uh, well, let's jump into our monumental questions. Sure. So what does success mean to you? Um, I think we already touched on it. I, I think... Um, the success for me is, is the freedom aspect. Um, it's that and the ability to do, you know, control my own time. And then the second piece of it is, is the relationship piece. When I look back when I'm done, right. Um, or whatever that looks like on my deathbed, I don't, I don't know how you put a, a pin in it, but you say, do you have, was what you did worthwhile and did the people you do it with was that also worthwhile? And did, cause the only thing that really matters in this thing is the relationship part. Like the money part doesn't matter. You know, everybody hopes to make some, but it doesn't matter. Um, and I think for me, it's, it's the relationship part. And did I control my time the way that I wanted to? And, and, you know, I'm not there yet. I, I still work a ton, but you know, we're building something that ultimately yeah. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. I love that. And you mentioned going skiing, going to the lake, going mountain biking. Yeah. So well, you do want to you, go right now or? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so how often do you, do you get out, um, get outdoors? Well, right now we're moving. So it's pretty much ruined my entire life. Um, <laughs> but uh, a lot, I, I mean, that's, that's kind of our happy spot, right? Where we live now is just outside of the Adirondacks in New York. And so our backyard is pretty exceptional. Um, you know, I like winter, my wife doesn't. So the move to, to Georgia is helpful. I think ultimately, Evan, we probably settle somewhere out West. My son is actually going to Colorado state in Fort Collins. Nice. Um, I really love like Salt Lake park city, you know, Denver. Um, my college roommate lives in Jackson hole. I, you know, I would ski as much as I could if I, if, if I could ski in the lake are pretty much my two favorites. Yeah. Yeah. I'm right there with you. Um, okay. So, uh, do you have any daily habits or rituals? 
Um, I try to. Uh, my wife tries to get me to journal more. I'm not. I'm not consistent with that. Um, and and I've tried the um, meditation route, and I'm not consistent with that either. The one thing that I do do a lot of is work out. Um, you know, that's my that's my time. You know, um, when I work out in the morning, it's a different day. I feel different. Um, and you know, that can be anything for everybody. It doesn't have to be going pushing weights around in the gym. We actually own a gym. So <laughs> that's kind of nice. where I go. Uh, <laughs> but you know, it, it can be whatever it is that gives you that, you know, adrenaline in them or that epinephrine in the morning that, you know, starts my day a different way. So yeah. for me, as much as I can, I, I try to start it with that. Um, it doesn't always happen, but um, that's, that's the best thing I could say. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So in uh, book recommendation, you recommended um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Do you have a favorite book or book you're currently reading? Um, I'm, I'm looking over on, on my desk. Uh, I think it's called Moments Matter. It's, if, if I could get up and go walk over right now, I, I don't remember the name of it. Um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad is a great one. You know, it's kind of the quintessential entrepreneurial book. Um, the other one that that I just read before the one I'm reading right now, and I apologize, I don't know what it is. I probably should have prepared better. Um, but I just finished Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. Actually, yeah, here it is. So I don't know if you YouTube this, but there's the book. Um, fascinating. Have you read it? No, I haven't. It's on my list. So Evan, the, the thing, and I'll just give you the one piece of, from it, and, and there's great stories in there, right? Like he's created an icon, a world icon. So, yeah. you know, it's relevant for everyone. But the thing that stood out to me the most with this book is Nike was a complete mess the whole way. Like they didn't have anything figured out to the point where they like weren't meeting payroll, like after Jordan was signed, right? Like it was such oh, wow. a they were struggling literally until they went public. And then there's one of his chapters ends and says like, and the next day I was worth $180 million or, <laughs> you know, I, I don't remember the exact yeah. number, but, but literally they grind, they were grinding every day, even as it, Nike was huge. I mean, it was big boy Nike, but until they went public, yeah. like it was grind problem, grind problem another eight feet problem, another eight feet problem. And then obviously once they had this monster infusion of capital, then, you know, they took the company to where it is now. And, yeah. you know, uh, it's, everybody knows the, the end point, but that was what stood out to me is what a mess it was <laughs> all the way through. Yeah. That's, that's honestly a great lesson. Cause that, I feel like we, we need to be perfect and you really don't No. It's, I, I hope that's true because I'm certainly <laughs> certainly not. <laughs> you and me both. So, um, so in closing, how can our listeners reach out to you, follow you, get in touch with you? Sure. So, Evan, we have um, a website with a bunch of real estate, um, I guess, education pieces. Um, and really, we've built it more for our investors to say, you know, we get a lot of questions that are the same, right? Like, hey, Why? Um, so it's chrisbenson.com, Chris with a K. So K R I S B E N S O N.com is, uh, just kind of an educational, it's all free. Um, if you're interested in the investment side of it, it'll take you there too. If you're interested in us as a platform, uh, reliantinvestments.com, um, will give you a good oversight into, uh, the company and, and what we do and our track record. Um, and then finally, I'm, I'm pretty active in LinkedIn. I post you know, fairly frequently and always happy to connect with people there and, um, you know, occasional fun videos and, and pictures there too. So, um, my name again is Chris Benson. It's with a K and if you search me with Reliant, you'll probably find me. Now there's also a pitcher whose name is Chris Benson and it's spelled with a K played <laughs> for the Mets and the Orioles for a long time. That that's not me. <laughs> Different Chris. That's true. Well, Chris, I had a blast. I learned a lot today. Um, learned a lot from your story about self storage and, and really a lot about life. And I'm really glad to have you on the show today. And um, thank you again for coming on. Yes, yeah, been my pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity to share a story with the audience and, and hopefully they found some value in it as well.
Yes. And, and monumental listeners, if you enjoyed today's episode uh, with Chris, make sure to reach out to Chris. Also share it on social media, uh, share it on LinkedIn, let other people know you're listening, let Chris know, tag him, tag me. And with that, have a monumental day. 